Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. Well, I want to speak to, to one thing you said where you, you were, you were, uh, you had a stack of papers and going through this stuff. And, you know, I, I had had the, exactly the same experience. I mean, it was amazing. You look at this stuff and you think, my God, th- this is just what is going on here. And nobody knows this. What, what happened to me was I, I started looking into this and thinking, you know, this is, this is just incredible. And I wrote several articles on my website for it. And, and then at some point I said, well, you know, I have to write a book about this because th- this is just too important just, just to have a few articles on my website. And, and so, so I did, obviously. Um, but back to your question about high, high ferritin levels and whether or not somebody could, ha- could have a high ferritin and, and be healthy otherwise. Um, there was a recent study that looked at people with the, uh, with the genes for hemochromatosis. People with the genes for hemochromatosis can have a wide range of ferritin levels. So not all of them get super high, right? So, so somebody with hemochromatosis that has the obvious health problems may have a ferritin levels over 1,000, over 2,000, even higher. But other people, for various reasons, may not develop ferritin levels that high, even, even with the gene, because there are so many factors that go into iron levels. You know, just, just to name a couple, alcohol consumption. Alcohol increases the rate of iron absorption. Vitamin C, you know, from, from orange juice, dr- increases the rate of iron absorption, things, things like that. So it depends on what people eat and um and genetic makeup and and other factors so anyway there are there are people with the hemochromatosis genes that have a wide range of ferritin levels not all of them necessarily super high and they looked at the at a a lot of people that have these hemochromatosis genes but were not necessarily diagnosed with hemochromatosis and they found that these people had much higher risks of various health problems liver disease heart disease and so on than others in the population. So what does that show that that seems to show that high ferritin levels, even even when not as high as to cause hemochromatosis, are damaging, generally speaking. Whether whether one individual necessarily has health problems if they have a relatively high ferritin Maybe, maybe not. Um, but in general, higher ferritin levels are associated with with health problems in this in this population. Yeah, for sure. And and the data is very compelling that in general it's a really bad sign. I mean, even the studies we referred to and I referred to earlier. And I was just piqued or my curiosity was piqued. Are there exceptions that prove the rule? Um, a bit like, I mean, you can take familial hypercholesterolemia. People who are, have familial hypercholesterolemia have a genetic susceptibility to damage from the modern environment. That's the way I view it, like APOE4 people. As some of them who have very high particle numbers go to long, healthy lives with no problem with atherosclerosis, and some burn up really young. Now, I think the environmental influence is huge that interacts with the high particle count. But again, you know, there may be a pocket of high ferritin people where their physiology is running a high ferritin, but manages to keep it safe, like you say, in the ferritin macromolecule. And it's it's just kept physiologic and it's okay. But to be honest, we're not going to get the data for that. The message today for people is ferritin is a really powerful risk factor with many, many mechanisms. And I'll just mention, actually, years ago, I, I came across a Chris Cresser video called Iron Behaving Badly. 
and uh, it was it was quite a good summary and Chris a really smart guy but it was essentially the same as what we're talking about broadly speaking you know it is something to really watch and watch carefully and the dimwits who are just looking at their cholesterol and not looking at ferritin and GGT and other key markers you know you're kind of missing wood for trees in many cases Absolutely. Uh, there, there was there is another. I, I'm just remembering here just something I saw uh, a couple of days ago. A study about <clears throat> heterochronic parabiosis, which uh, to those very is of great interest to those of us who are interested in the anti aging field and aging research. Um, and so, heterochronic parabiosis involves exchanging the circulations of two lab animals, usually mice. And this is the so-called, probably most people have heard of this, the you know young blood rejuvenating idea. Anyway, in this particular experiment, what they found was this was highly related to iron, that the old animals had higher levels of tissue iron and that being exposed to the young blood from, from the younger animals lowered their levels of tissue iron. And um, the, these particular researchers concluded that iron was a huge factor in this phenomenon of heterochronic parabiosis. This, this is something, um, you know, all modesty aside that I've been saying for a while. Here's another, another interesting factor about this in heterochronic parabiosis is that old blood appears to be worse for a young animal than the young blood is good for the old animal. So, you know, you think, oh, well, what's going on here? Maybe it's iron. You know, that that's the obvious thing that occurs to me. And and animals do accumulate iron as they age. Uh, there, was, there was a good study about that, how, how it's related to sarcopenia, and that the anti the, the known anti-aging <clears throat> treatments that 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 we know work, for instance, in lab animals, calorie restriction giving them much less food. It also means they accumulate much less iron as, as they age. So I, iron, you, you know, there's an iron angle here at everything. I'm not saying that that's the whole story by any means, but this is, it's just, it's just an overlooked factor here in, in not only in disease, but in, in aging in general. Yeah, for sure. And actually, you wrote, uh, I'm so busy the past couple of years, I can't keep up with anyone's books. But you've also written a book on anti-aging. So if we twisted uh, away from iron for a, for a moment, uh, any thoughts you have on anti-aging in general? I mean, I have I have thoughts, and I, myself and Dr. Gerber wrote a, essentially a longevity book, Eat Rich, Live Long. Um, but it's all the usual things like the critical vitamins, minerals, the lower carb, no vegetable oils, you know, resistance training, blah, blah, fasting. Everything is in there, including a bit on iron. But uh, but your book on longevity, yeah. Would you want to pull out some of your, your top things that you're excited about? You know, it, it's like you you just said that that uh, most of the things that conduce to good health are are also anti-aging. So, for example, you know, we know that in, in lab animals, restricting their food makes them live longer. So for human beings, fasting is, is an obvious uh, anti-aging in, intervention. And what's, what's interesting is the parallels between aging and obesity. So when human beings age they their insulin resistance increases they tend to get more body fat and lose muscle um, and they accumulate iron obviously but so but so many of these there's so many parallels between obesity and aging um, when we age we're not able to regulate metabolism as well at least that you know that those are the facts what's causing that how much of that is due to aging and how much of that is due to uh, uh you know uh, the modern environment modern lifestyle that's a good question the, these are these are actually kind of uh deep questions because even when you study laboratory animals you get into um I, i've discussed this on my on my site quite a bit 
well, you know, if you're feeding them garbage and keeping them in cages, how, how much, you know, is that really a study of aging? Um, you know, if you feed them less garbage and they live longer, well, that, you know, that makes sense. But is it really anti-aging or just feeding them less garbage? In any case, what, what we can do for anti-aging, the most important things are those things that are the opposite of obesity and insulin resistance. So have a low level of body fat, a high level of muscle, have a high level of insulin sensitivity. To my, in my view, that calls for eating, eating whole, minimally processed foods, preferably lower in carb, but certainly not including refined, refined grains, sugar, and vegetable oils. Those are out. In a nutshell, that's what I think that people should do for anti-aging is, is, is body composition and infl- insulin sensitivity are very important. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And I I love as well, I mean, for the general person who's not going to get into all of the different factors here and the myriad factors, you know, sugar refined carb, veg oil elimination and the processed foods that carry those constituents, because ultra processed food is full of vegetable oils and refined carb. Take all that out and just eat real food. Most people, if they start young enough, wouldn't even have to worry too much about counting macros to the last degree. You know, that that's the reality. I always loved uh, Dr. Ron Rosedale's phrase, and maybe he took it from somewhere. He said, diabetes is essentially a model of accelerated aging. And that, yeah, Yes, very good. Yes, I agree with that. And it, it's so perfect because all the diseases of modernity, all the chronic diseases that have come in the last century, diabetes accelerates them all. And... There was a lovely study by Professor Gerald Reeven, the kind of master of insulin resistance research, and it only had a few hundred middle-aged people, but they were randomly picked, and he split them into tertiles, thirds of insulin sensitivity, with a really accurate uh, steady-state plasma glucose insulin test. So a proper test, not just a fasting insulin. And basically, the bottom third who were insulin sensitive over seven years had zero disease, death, or any problem. The middle third had 12 cases of disease and death out of the whatever 80 number. And the top third of insulin resistance had 28. And it was cancers, diabetes, and all the hypertension, all the usual stuff. And he basically, they they said essentially insulin resistance or sensitivity kind of sits at the center of, of diseases of aging. But still though, I know I met doctors six years ago and I started my research. Good guys. I, I'm not, I mean good guys. And they actually were not really familiar with metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance syndrome. And only when they Googled it after I told them, uh, they came back to me and said, oh my God. And they were quite frankly shocked. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left.